Hello and welcome to Women in Post, a podcast and web series for women in post-production by Women in Post-Production. Today on the show, we'll be speaking with Aurora. Sometimes you wouldn't have a perfect show. The whole day would be crazy. News would break really late. The guests would be late. Everything would be happening late. (laughs) So Aurora, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Um, Aurora is an editor known for her work on The Nightly Show with Larry Wilmore, Greatest Ever, and The Price is Right, oh, and The Daily Show, among other TV shows. Um, Aurora, is is it fair to say that you're like a comedy TV editor? Yeah, that's how I would classify myself. Also, IMDb says I'm known for The Price is Right. That's just because I was on The Price is Right. Just so we know, I did not edit on The Price is Right. <laughs> I've seen, like, this one's a little bit different. But <laughs> I, I, IMDb sometimes, like, it sometimes does that. There's, I feel like there's been a couple people. I was like, yeah, you can't trust that website. Like, it's not accurate. <laughs> I mean, I was on it. I was on a contestant, but it gets, it, as a contestant, but it's, it gets confusing because, you know, people think of me as an editor, so they assume I must have edited for The Price is Right. So I was just saying why one of these things is not like the other. Did you, did you like being on the show? Was it fun? Oh, of course. It was my absolute, one of my childhood dreams come true. Oh. <laughs> I won a car. You won a car? Yeah. Oh my gosh. So you won the show. What kind of car did you get? A Chevy Cruze. Oh my gosh. All right. All right. All right. Um, okay. So, um, what, so what started your interest in post-production or in film in general? So, (laughs) well, it's tough to say now in 2020 because things are different. And I will say this person who made me want to get in the entertainment industry is now thought of as like a problematic person. So it's hard to talk about them with the same like gusto that I did when I was young. But I always knew I wanted to work in the entertainment industry since I was like two. I mean, since I, or one, I mean, since I could stand up in a diaper, if I would watch Michael Jackson on TV, I just knew I was like, he is changing the world. He is inspiring people. He is so interesting. I want to be involved in making something as amazing and theatrical and beautiful and incredible and like, you know, life changing and inspiring as the stuff that he is doing. And I dreamt that one day I would go work for him. But then and I went to Berklee College of Music specifically because that's where Quincy Jones went. And I'm like, well, if that's where Michael Jackson's producer went. That's where I'm going to go. Quincy Jones and I are going to be best friends. (laughs) (laughs) Michael Jackson. Um, And then he died while I was in college. And so I didn't get to work for him. Uh, I did later work for his family, which was fun and nice and great. Um, But yeah, he is the reason I wanted to work in the entertainment industry. Obviously, I, I love a million TV shows. I love TV. There's a lot of things that I love. But he was like, the thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was like um, JTT magazines when we were kids. Except just TV. Maybe, okay, okay. <laughs> Never mind. No, so, sorry. I was like, I was like, no. I, I don't know. I feel like I somehow uh, didn't pay attention to them. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. That's okay. I'll cut that part out. <laughs> so people don't know I'm such a loser. <laughs> no, like everybody in my school was obsessed with JTT. We all had like these magazines and um and this cute like boy cut hair face whatever. Okay. Anyways. Um, oh, JTT, like Jonathan Taylor Thomas? Yes! Yeah! <laughs> uh, whatever happened to him? I have no idea. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, so, at what point, like, uh, two years old is really, really early. <laughs> 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 That's got to be a record. Like... <laughs> So at what point did you like really full on like start pursuing this? And when did you know that you had like broken in? When did you know that you had quote made it? So, I mean, I went to high school for musical theater and I went to college at a music conservatory. uh, And I, and like, I joined my first entertainment industry union as a teenager. I I, like, I would say a lot of things were kind of on the early side because I just absolutely I I just, I've always known, my parents have always known, everybody's always known. (laughs) They're like, yep, this girl, she's going to work in entertainment. We know it. And uh, so I don't think it surprised anybody that that's what I did. As far as like when I knew that I had like made it, 
I would say that I still don't even know that I have made it per se, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's like, this is how I pay my bills. This is what I do for a living. I am in multiple unions. I am a member of the television Academy finally. So that feels great to vote for the Emmys. So I guess there are a lot of like things that you could say, okay, well you, you've made it. This is how you make your living. This is how you afford to live, you know, various things. But I don't know. It's hard to ever say that like you, you've made it or you haven't. Um, okay, wait, wait, wait. Did you just say that you vote for the Emmys? Yeah, because I'm in the Television Academy, so I get to vote on them. Wow. That's, a, yeah. that's so... I guess I just didn't realize that people actually vote. Like, the, I thought there was some, like, you know, in The Wizard of Oz, some guy stands, like, behind the green curtain and makes all the decisions. That's like, I thought there was some just divine, like, authoritative, like, this person decides everything. <laughs> of course people vote on it. Oh, my gosh. What is that like? It's pretty cool. Um, they they send you a ton of DVDs, although I'm pretty certain this is the last year they're going to ever do DVDs because, I mean, that's ridiculous. We all have the internet now. I think they're going to stream everything from here on out. But they send you DVDs. They send you links and stuff to websites with special codes that you can watch shows in case you don't have cable or this or that. And any you are allowed to vote in any of your own categories. So since I'm in as an editor, I can vote in any ca editing category. And then you also get to vote in any overall category, like best comedy, you know, et cetera. You don't get to vote for any categories you're not involved in. So like I can't vote for best actress in a comedy or something like that. Okay. Um, and then they do make you sign this little affidavit thing that says, I have watched everything in this category. Like I, I've watched at least one episode of all five of these shows. I am voting, you know, with some knowledge in mind. <laughs> um, yeah. So you have to watch everything and then you just vote online. It's not that hard. And, and then that's it. Wow. That's so interesting. Like if I wanted, if I wanted to sign up and be like, Hey, I want to do this tomorrow. Would they, would they say, Hey, no way. Like you have to meet this certain criteria or do you have to pay to like be a part of the club or how does that work? all of it. You, you have to pay dues and you do have to meet certain criteria. I don't know that I know the absolute exact criteria off the top of my head because it's been a little while now since I've gotten to join, but it's something along the lines of you've, you've had to work at your level. Like I think even assistant editing or assistant at any position doesn't count. I think you have to work at like the level of whatever job it is. Um, you know, for I think three out of four years in a row. So if you have one bad year in the middle of four years, you're okay. And you have to have a certain number of episodes and like a certain number of shows that you've worked on. And yeah, you have to hit some various benchmarks. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what are some of the goals that you're pressing forward to in the future? That's a good question. Um, also, this is random, so I don't know if you can, like, edit this to make it look like it's less random or not. You can just keep it random. Who cares? But I was, <laughs> I was rambling about your question earlier about when I had made it, and I, even though I, I still stand by the fact that I don't necessarily think I've made it, I do actually have, like, one tiny little humble brag story that I do really like to tell that I feel like might be kind of, like, a way that I've known that I've made it, which is... Um, so I have like a gajillion various dreams in life, as you can already tell, that I'm like, oh, I wanted to go on The prices Right, and I wanted to meet Michael Jackson, and I wanted to do this and this, and like I'm kind of all over the place, but it's all sort of related. But one of my many, many, many dreams was to work for Jon Stewart, and I finally got to do it, and it was totally, like, it was totally a dream come true. And he was our executive producer on The Nightly Show, and on our final day of work, I had written thank you cards to everybody in the building, because I, I absolutely loved everybody so much. And when I gave him his, I was like already near tears. And as I was handing it to him, I was like, I was like, um, you don't need me to tell you this because it says this in the card. I was like, but I really, I just want to thank you from the bottom of my heart. Like, I will never be able to thank you enough. You literally changed my whole entire life. I was like, I, you know, for so long, I've been wanting to see what it's like to live in New York. I've wanted to work on a daily show and see how tough that is. I've wanted to work it on a political show, um, you know, to kind of bring light and, and funniness to something that's so important and to keep it in people's lives and to keep them informed, but in an interesting way. I was like, I just, I had so many goals 
and you made them all possible. Like this job did all of them. Like I moved to New York for this. Uh, this is the first time I've ever worked on a political show. You know, I'm like, I got promoted here. Like I, that was where I got promoted from assistant editor to editor. I was like, you changed my whole entire life and I can never thank you enough. And then, oh my God, John Stewart, one of my like idols looks at me and then he goes, he's like, Aurora, thank you, but no. He's like, you changed your own life. He's like, every single person in this building is here because they are the best at what they do. And that includes you. You know, he's like, you got here because of your own creativity and tenacity and like all this stuff. And he's just like complimenting me. He's like, so that was you, not me. And then I'm just like crying. I'm like, thank you. <laughs> and then we took a selfie together and it was like one of the best days of my whole entire life. <laughs> oh my gosh. Wow. Yeah. So anyway, I just want to put that humble brag story in there. <laughs> 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 wow. Well, how, okay, so I have some questions about what it was like then for you to be there and to be doing that job in New York with this, like, incredible person, like, on a political show that's also comedy. Like, there's just so much going on. First off, I will always feel like one of the luckiest people in the world that I got to work on such an incredible show. I mean, I don't, I, it's like I hardly even know where to start because I could talk about it for days, how it was just like, Everything about it was the greatest. Um, one thing that was really nice about the nightly show is, and I think a big part of this is because it was helmed by a, a black man. Like Larry Wilmore was, you know, the host and one of the executive producers. So I think he paid attention to diversity way more than most white men do. And m white men usually are at the helm of TV shows. <laughs> and, uh, and, but our show was like incredibly diverse way more than any other place I've ever worked, uh, in every way, like, it, you know, racially, uh, like gender, even just like where people came from and the belief systems. And I mean, granted, almost all of us were liberal, of course, but like, um, but yeah, so I loved that. I loved going to a place where like, if we did a story about something, somebody in the building had like a personal you know, way into that story. And, and we would listen to them. Like I've worked at some places where if we're doing a story about women per se, and there aren't very many women on staff and the few women who are on staff are like, you guys, this isn't really like how this is, or this isn't really like this joke is kind of sexist or blah, 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 where people are like, yeah, whatever. Nobody cares. Like, and they just ignore them. But at the nightly show, it wasn't like that at all. It was like, we would listen to people and it was just nice to have the different perspectives and the different people. And it was so nice to have other women on the editing staff. My boss was a woman and that almost never happens. And like, and we had another female editor on staff. And I think that's the, that's the only show I've ever worked on where I wasn't the only female editor on staff. Um, the only other show that I've worked on, I was not an editor here. I did something else, but, um, I worked on Project Runway for kids, and that's that's like the only show I've, other than the nightly show, that I've ever worked on where there have been a number of female editors, but I think it's because it's thought of as like a woman's show. Um, so yeah, so it was nice to actually have women around. <laughs> um, so yeah, so anyway, I'm, I'm rambling. I always do. I loved the diversity. I loved, I loved the, um, you know, just that we had to do a show every night, and it's like, one way or another, this is airing at 1130. Like it has to get on the air. So you just kind of have to do your job and you have to make it happen. And so that was like a really fun challenge. It was also good because I think, I like to think sometimes it, it helped me a little bit to learn how to kind of let go of things. Because sometimes you wouldn't have a perfect show. The whole day would be crazy. News would break really late. The guests would be late. Everything would be happening late. You would get everything late. And then you would, just because the show had to air, you would have to make some cut that like didn't even make any sense. <laughs> and people would be like, wait, are these professional editors? And it's like, hey man, show's got to go to air. I don't know what to tell you. Oh my and, gosh. But it was nice. It's kind of a nice like life lesson to be like, some days go better than others. 
years. And some days are going to look beautiful and be great. And some days aren't. But at the end of the day, you have to throw it away and you have to move on to the next one because you've got another show that's going to air at 1130 all over again. <laughs> what is it like? What is the record um, the time that they stop running the cameras and you start editing? Like how much time do you have to produce the nightly show? So it kind of depends on the day because we always had goals to do it early and then kept not happening. But I would say that usually, well, I don't know, depending on the day, I guess usually it would probably get to me around 8-ish p.m., but then you still would want to get it out the door kind of as fast as you could. You obviously didn't want to be getting it out the door I mean, you couldn't get it out the door at 1130 because then you'd have to be airing like live from where you were and that would be bad. <laughs> um, and so basically what would happen is we would edit it. We would be as quick as we could. And then every night you would go down to the control room and you would watch it go in real time, like with the control room. And there would be people on the other side, like with the network who would also be watching it. And so you all would be watching it in real time from like, let's say nine thirty to 10. And then if there's anything wrong with it, you still have a little bit of chance if they're like, Oh, you, you missed bleeping a curse word or like you missed this. You could go in and like punch it in really fast and fix it. By the time we were watching it in real time, there were almost never any mistakes because people do try to be really on top of it. But that was kind of the goal is to like watch it down from like 9.30 to 10. If there's any problems, you can fix them. And if not, then you're good and you can just go home. Uh-huh. Uh, it sounds like it's got to be really efficient, like in the editor's seat. Did you have somebody like watching your edit or approving your edit or anything like that? Or was it just like you do what you know you have to do and push it out the door every day? So it was interesting because we were kind of a new show that sadly didn't, I mean, we only had two seasons. And so I wish we had had more on the nightly show. And we were, we were kind of still figuring out the best ways to do it, even as we were ending, because we used to do it where each editor, because we had four editors on the show between the field pieces and the montages and the actual show and da 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 and so we used to do it where like one of us would have a very specific day like every Monday you do the final show so that that way nobody has to stay until 10 or 11 p.m every single night but then nobody really gets into the in, uh I don't know what word I'm looking for but you know you don't get into the rhythm of like actually doing the final show Know, and it always was kind of different because a different person's doing it every night and da 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 So then it was like, okay, well, we're going to have one final show editor and that's, and that person will just have a late shift, which is nice because I like working late anyway. Um, so yeah, it, it, so we were kind of like figuring it out depending, but whenever I did the final show, basically what happens is, or what happened for us was the woman who was in charge of post-production, which I guess would normally be called a post like a post supervisor, but she did so much more than that. So I, I think her final title was like, I, I it's supervising producer maybe, which is way more correct as to, she did a lot. Um, but so she would go in to a meeting at the end after the show and it would be her and like the executive producers and, and Larry, the star of the show. And they would kind of say like, okay, you know, this, these are the things we want edited out or, and, or, this is very important to keep, like, don't get rid of this part of the conversation. And uh, we would try our best to acts one and two, just his monologue jokes and stuff, to just keep it as is and almost never edit those. We always tried to just get those, just keep them there and then only edit the final interview. And yeah, he would, he would say things he wanted kept or not kept. And then you would just kind of have to do that to the best of your ability. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, and then, go ahead, sorry. Well, and they didn't really like to, you know, they have to get in so early, the EPs and Larry and everybody, that they don't want to stay all the way to the very, very end of like transmitting to the network. So for the most part, they just kind of trust you. So like you have to get it right and you have to follow their notes. Uh-huh. Uh -huh. what, are, what are some of like the, the cornerstones of producing a show like that? What are some of the editing laws maybe or pillars that guide you? Interesting. Um, I think communication above all else for sure because there would be some times where you know like a, 
uh, like you would have to build like a, a fake commercial, like a spoof on a commercial, or you would have to build a super long montage, or you would have to, you would just have to build something that morning. And they might only give it to you with not very much time at all. And so it would be possible that you wouldn't be done by the time of rehearsal, but nothing can stop for you. But also, so you kind of have to turn in what you have, even if it's not done. But then you also have to really make sure that they know, like, this isn't done, you know, this is going to be 20 seconds longer, or this doesn't make sense, or blah, blah, blah. Because they want to know, like, like, oh, are you actually turning this in? <laughs> you know, so just like, communication is, is key for sure, because nothing can ever stop. And sorry, I guess I'm kind of losing your audio. Is Oh, sorry. Is this, is this oh, better? Oh, that's much oh, better. That's Okay, sorry, I my finger got in the way. <laughs> oh yeah, no, all I was saying is like communication is key because nothing can ever stop. Nobody can ever be waiting on you. So you just have to be communicating where you are with your piece, what you're doing, how much more time you need, like why you need that time, what you need from somebody else, if somebody can help you, if a producer can find a clip that you know you need, whatever. Um, and also because nothing can ever wait, just staying on top of things as much as possible. If somebody tells you you're going to have to edit a montage, you need to start edit editing that montage the moment you get your first clip. And you have to kind of stay around your desk as much as you can. Like, sometimes you would have downtime and you could go visit with people. And obviously, like, we got to go get lunch and stuff. But you really have to stay close to your desk because somebody might need you. <laughs> Does it take a really funny person to edit really funny shows? Um, I think it, I think it doesn't necessarily take a super funny person because you don't really have to be able to come up with jokes and quips and stuff. I mean, it helps if you have a sense of humor and if you're kind of fun to be around because you are working in a building with comedians, but you yourself don't really have to be a comedian. But the one thing you do have to have is comedy one thing that I think is good that I have a really musical background, you know, with like musical theater, high school, Berkeley college of music, all this stuff is because in some ways comedy is a song. Comedy has a rhythm to it, you know, and you want to get it right. And so I feel like with the nightly show or with any comedy, I mean, that's kind of the thing is you don't have to be able to come up with jokes, but you do have to make sure that the comedy sings in the way it's supposed to because bad timing can ruin a, a montage or a joke or something like that. Yeah, yeah. It, it could turn like a, a, what should be a funny joke into something like your dad said at the kitchen table. <laughs> it's like, yes. Oh, that was a bad one, dad. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so something that I noticed from your INVD is that you're super into like running. Does that, how does that um, cause a lot of editors, well, we, we sit in our seat all day, right? Like we just, I, I said to my husband yesterday, I was like, my butt is getting bigger. I'm getting like a shelf butt cause I'm sitting here trying to do all these podcasts. Like I need to get out and start doing something. So you, you run, um, how has that been for you in, in your editing career and your running interests? Yeah. So it's funny you mentioned that. I'm actually, I'm wearing my shirt from the LA marathon right now. <laughs> Um, I do. I love, I love to run. Um, yeah, I don't know when these are going to air or whatever, but as people might know, we're, we're all quarantined sort of right now, or we have the, I don't know officially what it's called, but all the lockdowns in the city, you know, we're only allowed to go out for very specific reasons. And I'm, I'm, I'm dying without the gym. I've been trying to run outside, but I really, I miss the treadmill. And so I actually, I ordered a treadmill <laughs> just to be here in just a couple of days. Cause I'm like, this is the only way I'm going to survive during this. <laughs> but, um, yeah, I mean, I, I like live to run. Running is one of my very favorite things. And so I think, I mean, I think running kind of helps to keep your brain alive a little bit. I think the fact that I'm a little bit, I can't find this word, blah, 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 blah. You can tell that I haven't gone running in a little while. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited about my treadmill coming. Um, but yeah, I, I do think it's nice because like you said, editors do sit all the time. And I, I, I love when places have standing desks or like those desks that go up and down. I think that's really nice. I always try, this wasn't so possible on the nightly show because you weren't necessarily supposed to like, leave campus, <laughs> um, you know, during the day, but on shows where it doesn't matter where you're not doing it that night, I try to always use my lunch break to go to the gym. Um, cause yeah, I think it's, I think in such a sedentary job, you have to 
be really careful to try to like, you know, keep your life going and, and keep your health about you. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Oh my gosh. So, yeah. you, so you can't go out right now and you're in California and LA? Yeah. Okay. So how, like, how is that affecting you in, in your career right now? Yeah, it's not good. <laughs> yeah. yeah, because it's like, I, I, I had a job that is now just totally, we're taking a, a break for a month. They said we're going to come back. Right now, the mayor's orders are that we can only go outside for like essential jobs. Um, we can go for, to, to get food, groceries, we can go to the pharmacy. And we are allowed to take walks and runs around our our neighborhood. We are allowed to stay like a little bit active, but we're not supposed to be driving anywhere to my knowledge and blah, blah, blah. blah. Anyway, I'm kind of rambling. Again, this is why I need a treadmill. I need a life. I need to go to work. I need to see people. Um, But yes, because basically because the mayor said we can't do any non-essential jobs. And I guess at least for now, the entertainment industry is not essential. Uh, None of us can work right now. So the mayor's orders are in effect until April 19th. They could be extended. They could not be. I don't know. My job says we're all coming back on April 20th when the order is lifted. We'll see. I am, I just ordered a new Mac so that I can try to set up a really nice at-home workstation. It's probably something I should have done a while ago because I would get offered to do stuff at home. And I'm like, well, I'm doing enough, like, out in the world in offices for TV shows. I don't need to worry about getting an at-home workstation, but... I wish I would have earlier because it'd be nice to have it all set up, but it will be set up before you know it. Um, (laughs) Yeah. And then, so at least I'll have the option to work from home. That is one nice thing about being an editor is I don't know how people are going to be making content or with everybody not having as much of a stream of income. I don't know how many people are going to be hiring editors, but I do know that at least that is something you can do from home. It's hard to, you know, if you're a camera person, I don't know how you really use your skills, like just working from home. Yeah, let me take a, a video camera of myself doing, sitting around. <laughs> like, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so when you get your, when you get your Mac and it comes in, that's super exciting. Congratulations. Um, will you be like, will you have your, um, do you work in Avid or Premiere or Final Cut or what? I have worked jobs in all three. Um, I prefer Avid more than anything. That's definitely going to be my main one that I go to when I do stuff from home, unless people specifically say they want the premiere project. And then barely anybody works in Final Cut anymore, at least that I know. Mm -hmm. So I've been looking into like ways that editors can work from home. And like a lot of people have the software on their computer, but apparently there's like, you can remote into a computer and edit like in the cloud? Is that something that you've heard of? I don't know. Have you, have you worked with anyone who's doing that already? I have not. I haven't worked with anybody editing like in the cloud. Okay. That seems like magic. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds like magic. Yeah. I definitely want to do that. Okay. So what kind of projects do you anticipate are you guys doing um, in the next month since like the future is, the future is like this big unknown blob right now um like people let's just say the people that have contacted you and said hey um would you be interested in editing this you know at your own workstation what kind of projects are those and where are they coming from where how do they find you so I guess it all depends I mean I think partially people find me just because you know, people talk to other people and then they'll ask somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody like, oh, do you know any editors? And then they kind of find me that way. Or it's people I've worked with before, like on TV shows who then went out to do smaller things and they met some YouTube person or whatever. And then, but they still have my contact info. So that's, yeah, kind of how that usually happens. And then as far as like little projects, I mean, it could depend depending on who the person is and what they need. It could be something either really small or really big. Like, I, uh, I mean, there, there has been someone who's asked me basically if I wanted to work on like an entire TV show from home, which I would have definitely done. But I think at the time I ended up getting hired on some other TV show that like paid more and then I didn't have to do it from home. And, and then also the one they wanted me to do from home, like there, something got held up in production and da, 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 da. It was a whole thing. But, um, yeah, I d- I'm going to I'm going to check in with that person maybe like right after this phone call and be like, "Hey, did production ever happen? Do you guys <laughs> Do you guys have the footage? Do you need somebody to edit?" <laughs> um, 
but yeah, usually it's smaller things. Usually it's maybe like a YouTube person um, who needs help with a vlog or it's like a, even like a TikTok person maybe. Or sometimes it's as simple as just like somebody on your Facebook feed wants to make like <clears throat> their husband or wife an anniversary thing or they want to make their kid, like I've done somebody's graduation thing with pictures of them, you know, from a kid growing up and blah, blah, blah. But yeah, I mean, you never know. It can be anything from small to big. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. So you you moved from New York to Cal. Wait, so you where did you grow up? Yeah. So yeah, it's all very complicated. I I'm I'm from California, like, okay. uh, but we moved when I was young. I mean, I don't remember how young, but young, like three, four, you know, whatever. Um, and then I went to I went to like two different elementary schools, three different middle schools, and then only one high school. We moved around the mid, yeah, we moved around the Midwest mainly. Like, uh, my dad was taking different insurance jobs and just kind of like moving up in the insurance world. (laughs) Um, and then I went to college in Boston and then I moved back to LA because I got offered a job and I was like, well, yeah, I should take it. I've always wanted to work in entertainment. I get offered my first job in TV. I'm going to go take it. But I always thought, okay, but I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to do the stuff. Then I went to New York and I kind of, I I won't say I did everything I wanted because life is long and exciting. And I want to live a life where I never do every single thing I wanted because if I start to get to the point where I've done close to everything I wanted, I want to start wanting more things. (laughs) Um, But I, I did... I would say that I checked off my initial New York bucket list. I I lived in Times Square, which I wanted to do. I worked for Jon Stewart. I worked for The Daily Show. Like, so obviously I did late night politics. And then it just kind of, the way my life worked out and the job opportunities that I was getting, it seemed like more was happening in California. And I love California. And I was like, okay, well, I've, I've done everything for now in New York. I'm ready to leave. So now I'm back in California and uh, yeah, just kind of, of taking it to see what's next. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. How did you? Um, I guess this is this is going to be like a weird question, but most I, I think most people who work in post are like introverts. But you are clearly like not an introvert. Like, how did this become a thing for you? And like, do you ever feel? Do you ever feel like the one person who's? extroverted in a sea of introverts or do you just find all the extroverts wherever you go um yeah it definitely it always weirds people out a little bit that I'm an extrovert who's an editor sometimes people love it they're like oh my god an extrovert somebody I can talk to and hang out with and sometimes they're like who are you I expect my editor to just be like super quiet never say anything or speak out loud (laughs) (laughs) um yeah I will say that definitely a show like The Nightly Show is more the job that I'm supposed to have as an editor because on most other types of shows that I've worked on, like like that cooking show that we were talking about at the beginning or like reality shows or that kind of thing, um, for the most part, I feel like usually, at least in my life, people just kind of hand you the footage and they're like, okay, do this. And there's not there's, there's barely any face to face. On the one hand, that's nice because it kind of gives you this relaxed lifestyle where you're working sort of at your own pace, as long as you're hitting the deadline and nobody really cares what time you take lunch or like, you know, if you're out for an hour and five minutes instead of an hour, you know, whatever, which makes it easy to go to your workout classes and whatever. And then, yeah. So I like that editing has nice flexibility usually and and that kind of thing but because I am an extrovert I'm not great at just sitting in a room all day Uh, but on a political show so often producers would have to come into your room and work with you because it was happening so fast and in real time and they're like we have to make a montage you know with all this stuff from Fox News like let's get it and let's make and you'd be making it like together and it would be extremely collaborative and that was kind of perfect for me because I still had some flexibility, some alone time, but I had a lot of my like nice face-to-face like extrovert time. Nice. I think, I think ultimately this probably is not the right thing to say on a podcast for like women in post, but I mean, just to be like totally honest, I think kind of what happened was what I want to do is like 
write and perform and produce like so many people do want to do. And I am working on that. You know, I'm like taking classes and I wrote a musical and I'm putting stuff out in the world and I'm trying, but kind of the path that my sort of like day job has taken me has just been post. What happened was I was a PA, just like a set PA. And then, and, and I got along really well with a lot of people. And then one person asked me, they're like, Oh, we need transcribers. Um, I would love to give you another job. You're, are you pretty fast at typing? Do you want to do this? And I was like, yeah, sure. I'd love to do this. Cause weirdly it was an on location job, which almost never happens. Uh, but I got to go to Vegas for a month. I was like, yeah, let's do this. So then once I got into transcribing, an assistant editor job came up that was sort of half an assistant editor job. They, they already had a few assistant editors on staff. They needed one more but they sort of only needed half a person. So they ended up hiring me because I didn't really know anything about assistant editing, but they're like, well, you have a lot of spunk and you know, you like really want to do well. And you were obviously good with computers in general because you studied music engineering at Berkeley. So you know how to use pro tools and logic and that might not be avid, but they're related in certain ways. And they're like, so we'll both benefit because you'll get an assistant editor credit and you can start like moving up in the world a little bit and we'll get somebody for less money than we would normally pay for a true assistant editor. So then once you have your first assistant editor credit, you kind of just get more. That's not, that's not usually crazy hard to keep getting more. So then that happened. And then the whole time on the side, I was still working on writing and performing and this and that, but it wasn't like happening, happening. And then, and then I got the nightly show, which was a dream come true to work on in any capacity. And then at the nightly show, my boss was kind of like, yeah, you're a good assistant editor, but you're a better editor because you are creative and you have good comedic timing and da 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 da. And then she was like, and then a spot opened up as an editor. And then she was like, I think weirdly you'll actually do better at this, the harder job, the job you're moving up to. Not that I was like a bad assistant editor. She just kind of saw where like I fit better. And then, and then it was like, okay, now I'm an editor. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh. It sounds, when do you have time to sleep? You're doing all this stuff. Like how did you, so how did you get onto the nightly show? Did somebody know you? Did you know somebody in there? So it's like next to impossible to get on one of those shows. Yeah. I, oh, I still feel so lucky. So what ended up happening was I used the website staff me up like all the time. And I was using that. And the, my boss, the person who later became my boss at the nightly show, she had put on something on staff me up looking for people because she, so she had worked on the daily show for years. And then she was like, I'm kind of over New York. I'm going to try LA for a while. She went to LA. Then when they started the nightly show, they wanted to have somebody who knew post, you know, inside and out. She was an amazing editor on the daily show. I'm pretty sure she's like M Emmy nominated. She's incredible. Her name is Tanya Dreyer. I love her. You should interview her. <laughs> Give her info. She's incredible. Um, way better than me. You can just throw mine out and just talk to her. <laughs> but, um, she, so anyway, oh, so she'd been in California for a while. And then my understanding of what happened was they were like, we want somebody to run posts for the nightly show. We got to contact Tanya. She's the best of the best. She was such a good editor. She knows posts like nothing else. She worked for the daily show. She knows what's up. So then she was willing to go back to New York, um, to have this bump to being like in charge of all of post, um, you know, and moving up and whatever. She's like, all right, I'll go back. I liked working in late night and whatever. If you talk to her, you can see if, if I'm getting the story right. But um, so then because she hadn't been in New York for a while, she didn't have nearly as many New York contacts. And the New York contacts that she did have were either like, I don't know, retired at that point or they, or they were still working for The Daily Show and they didn't want to leave because that's such a stable job and blah, blah, blah. So she turned to staff me up. I wrote her. And then I didn't hear back. And I thought that I didn't maybe hear back because I looked like a California person. So somehow I found her contact information some other way. She put her name on it, which almost nobody does. I forget if it was like Twitter or like what happened, but I, I somehow was able to contact her, which is very hit or miss. Like sometimes if you contact somebody outside of a job post, they'll be like, oh my God, you are so annoying. And so I wouldn't necessarily recommend it always. 
but in this one specific case, I wrote her and I was just like, look, it is one of my dreams in life to work for Jon Stewart, the executive producer, and to come do a political show. I was like, I know that it says that I live in California because I do, but I swear to you, I will, I will get in a car and I will go to LAX right now like literally right now I was like I will get on a plane I don't care I'll leave all my stuff just like I want to do it and so then she wrote me back and she was and she was basically like okay she's like I was ignoring you because you're California but you obviously really want this I like your spunk she's like so let's talk so then we I had a phone interview at the time it was a phone interview for a junior editor position um, cause they weren't going to have an assist. They were just going to have a junior editor. And so the interview went pretty well, but because it was like an actual daily show where like you absolutely had to get things right like that day and there was no room for error. And because I had never edited at the time professionally, I had, you know, as sometimes as an assist, they would let me do small stuff for the internet or this or that. She's like, I love you and I love your personality. And I do think you have some skills. I don't know that you have the amount of skills that you need to jump in the deep end right now on a show that has like no room for error. So she didn't go with me. She went with somebody else, oh. um, somebody who actually had been an editor and took a step down to be a junior editor just because they wanted to work in late night so badly. So then every approximately three months or so, two to three months, I would write her and I would just say like, Hey, I really love the piece you guys did on XYZ. This was my favorite part. It was really funny. Like, great job. Hope you're having a great day. She never wrote me back. <laughs> I, was, I was like, I was like, oh God. I'm like, this woman is probably so annoyed by me. She hates me. She never writes me back. I'm like, but since I'm only emailing her once every like 10-ish weeks, that's probably not too much to annoy somebody to hate me, I hope. <laughs> like, and so, so I had done it like three times. And then finally, when I was doing it like the fourth time, I, I thought like, maybe I should stop. <laughs> she stop writing me back. She might hate me. And then I was like, but also maybe she's just busy. I don't know. <laughs> so I wrote her like one final time the same deal just being like this was really great da, 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 da. and then she wrote me back and she was like you have impeccable timing um she's like I uh sorry my brain just died for a second because I got so excited telling the story <laughs> yeah she, she was like she was like we're changing up some things about the staff I just like earlier this afternoon got approved to hire an assistant editor would you be interested in doing that and I was like, yeah, of course. I just want to work for you guys. And then she's like, okay, great. Can you come in for an interview? And I was like, yeah, yes, I can. And so within the week, I flew to New York. I went to an interview. At the time, I was working as an assistant editor on a show that just so happened to be Tuesdays to Saturdays. Um, and so I didn't even work Mondays. So the very next Monday, I, I was in New York. I was interviewing at the nightly show. Literally all I had with me was, were like the pajamas that I wore on the plane that I was also going to wear back and my like cute little pink interview outfit. That was it. I just had like a book bag because I was only supposed to be there for one day. And then in the interview, she was like, we love you. If you want this job, you have to start tomorrow. And I was like, oh. okay, I want this job. So as I walked out of the building, I like extended my hotel stay. I canceled my plane ticket back to California. I immediately went to Macy's to buy like enough clothes to get me through the rest of the week. I called my boss on my show in California and I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm not coming back. And she didn't even realize that I had gone to interview because I never worked Mondays, so I didn't have to get the day off. And she was like, what? And she's like, you're in New York? What is happening? She was so confused. I felt really bad about that because I never want to leave a job that way, but this was like my absolute dream come true. <laughs> um, yeah, and, that, and then I just, I stayed and I started coming back on some weekends to get my stuff and like move out and I found an apartment and I figured it out and, and yeah, that was, that was that. Wow, that is crazy. That's so yeah, exciting. And she, 
<laughs> Thank you. Yeah. And she later told me it was very sweet. She, uh, she, she told me later that I was the only person that she interviewed to be the assistant editor when that job came around, because I, I just assumed that she, you know, she was going to interview more people and it might not be me again and whatever. And she was like, no, <laughs> she's like, by the time that happened, it was so clear that you wanted to work here more than anybody else. You know, like you kept staying in touch with me. She's like the exact appropriate amount enough that I would remember you, but not so much to bother me. And then, and then I was like, I was so worried that you never wrote back. She's like, I was just busy. I still appreciated it. And, I was like, <laughs> <laughs> and then, yeah, she, she was just like, she's like, you wanted it more than anybody. So I knew that you would take it more seriously and care more than anybody. And you did. And, and then I got promoted and then that, and now she's one of my best friends. So that's that. Wow. Congratulations. I feel like, <laughs> yeah. So if, Someday, when you have your own show, what's yeah. it going to be about? Oh, man. Great, great question. <laughs> well, for, okay, so first off, I have a musical that's about domestic violence, um, which doesn't sound doesn't like a real like feel good. do at all. Okay, okay, go ahead. Sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, you did it. No, no, I feel like it's, um, I, I feel really good about that musical, and that, that, that's like the next thing I, I really am following with a huge passion is trying to do that because I feel like I tell it in a way that sort of only I can. Like it's my, my friends who've seen a reading of it say that they really like how it kind of walks this weird line where one minute you're laughing and then one minute you're crying. Cause I'm not trying to have it be 90 minutes of just sad, sad, sad. That's boring. You know, I want it to be 90 minutes of nuance and shockers and interesting things and, and songs that are catchy in ways that make you feel uncomfortable <laughs> and that kind of thing. Um, so yeah, that's definitely like my next my next definite thing that I want to do. But I would say in general, as far as shows I want to make and things I want to do, I want to make things that move the world forward at least a little bit and that, and that kind of make people think, even if it's just in the back of their heads, you know, a little bit like while they're laughing. I don't need to hit them over the head with, you know, and this is the moral of this story and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, I always want the world to keep becoming a more interesting, nuanced, tolerant, smart place. And I feel like entertainment does that better than anything else because almost everybody watches TV. Not everybody watches, you know, filibusters and this and that. I mean, I do because I really care about politics, but not everybody does. And obviously those people help. It's important to have senators. It's important to have laws. It's important to, you know, it's important to call your senators and have things be voted on. And, and, you know, I'm not trying to say like, oh, well, entertainment's going to save us all. Like, no, we should have a better president. Th that stuff is very important too. <laughs> lots, <laughs> lots of stuff in the world is important, but I do, I just feel like entertainment, it's universal. It reaches everybody and it does start to change things in, in ways that other things don't. Even like how so many people point to Will and Grace, which is just a normal sitcom that makes you laugh, that, you know, they weren't like constantly hitting you over the head every week with like lessons and all these, you know, like after school special moments about why it's okay to be gay and this and that. But it's, it's commonly referred to as like something that really kind of helped move rights and things forward for like the whole LGBT community because it, because people got used to seeing like just fun, normal people who happen to be gay. Like, you know, it wasn't like that was what the whole thing was about, but it's just like, well, that's who they are. And now they're in your living room. And when they feel, when they're in your living room, they feel like they're your family. And when they're your family, it's like, you can accept people more. Not that that's something like to accept, but it's just, entertainment moves the world forward. And so I want to do stuff that moves the world forward, even in whatever tiny ways it can. You know, I want to have diverse casts. I want to have people, I want to have diverse, like behind the scenes, everything. I'm tired of being in places with like nearly all men or nearly all white people. I'm tired of seeing things that look like that. Thankfully the tide is changing. Um, but yeah, so that's what I want to do. And that's one of the reasons I want to do the domestic violence musical is because I feel like that is a huge thing in our society. You know, I mean, three women in America die every day at the hands of a domestic partner. And it's like, that's, 
yeah, I just, but that's something that is kind of like, well, we don't talk about it because it's happening behind closed doors and it's not really our business, but maybe it is. And like, so yeah, I don't know if I'm making sense, but that's, that's the kind of stuff I want to do stuff that moves the world forward. I think that makes sense. Where, what is like the platform for that? Are you, are you thinking like on a stage in New York or a movie? Um, where, like, where will your musical live? So I think, you know, I, I mean, Broadway is the goal. Broadway. Okay. Yeah. Broadway is the goal. And then, you know, maybe to be turned into a movie if it became like a successful Broadway show, but I, uh, Broadway before anything else. Gotcha. Well, I really hope it happens for you. You are an amazing person and oh my gosh, Thank so you. much life going on right now. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much for being on the show and providing, you know, your insights into, you know, what you've done in your career is super interesting. And I think a lot of people are going to learn a lot from you and um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks for watching. I'd love to hear from you. If you enjoyed this week's episode, give us a like, leave us a question or a comment, and share with your friends. Your viewership and support helps promote women working in film. Follow us on Instagram, subscribe to us on YouTube, and join our Patreon community. Interested in being a guest or sponsor on the show? Send me a message. I'd love to hear from you. See you next week on Women in Post.